Welcome everybody, my name is Christian and today I'm going to go over some tips, tricks, and battle tactics for War of the Ring. It's a Lord of the Rings based game. It's based off of the books, so all the character art and stuff like that are all more of a book design rather than the, the movies, but I'll, you'll be able to figure out usually uh, who is who. So. I really enjoy this game for many reasons, but one of which is it's actually two games in one. There is a risk style military game in which the evil side has an advantage. And then there is a mini game of trying to get the hobbits or to get the ring from Rivendell all the way to Mount Doom. And in that way, the free peoples have a little bit of an advantage of having that happen. One thing that I disliked a little bit about the game was all the free peoples were blue and all the evil side was red. And so I went ahead and just got a few things of spray paint and sp spray painted the different nations according to the color that they are on the map except for Isengard. You know, Rohan's green. I didn't have the patience to paint each one individually, but I went ahead and just spray painted them. I uh, did the Nazgul black. It, it just made it, it, as you can tell, this is actually a lot easier to see what's on the map in the different countries, even though this is a little zoomed out than it would be if it was all the same color. So, you know, it was actually relatively easy. For some reason, even though I did this like two and a half weeks ago, it's still a little sticky. That's why I have some of the blue painter's tape from when I was playing earlier. It's a, still a little tacky. But either way, then that, that's just an overall suggestion to just enhance your experience. So, today I'm going to go over the free people strategy. There, there are two ways to win. You can either get four victory points or to destroy the ring. Destroying the ring is probably going to be more likely of a scenario for you than getting four victory points. Even though four victory points doesn't sound all that much, they're going to be the evil side is going to be hammering you so much. That's probably going to be something that you can't do. So try your best to move the fellowship at least one space per turn. The only circumstances where you wouldn't want to do that is if they are in a stronghold where you're healing them possibly, but for the most part, keep on trying to move them to Mount Doom. In terms of military victory, if you have a bunch of the end cards, you know, maybe uh, destroying Saruman and taking over Orthac could be a really good possibility for you. Or Moria being attacked from either Rivendell or Lorien if they attack you and they overextend themselves. But either way, for the most part, you're going to be winning by destroying the ring. Now, do remember that if you do try to move the fellowship a second time they're going to be able to find you easier for every time you've already moved the hunt threshold moves down one so you may want to try and move a second time if they only have one or two dice in the hunt for the ring box if they have a whole bunch you may want to go ahead and try to do other things and focus on other stuff so let's go over the fellowships and some of the strengths and weaknesses, both as a military aspect and in terms of moving the fellowship. The fellowship starts out being led by Gandalf. And as much as I like a Gandalf the Grey, he should actually be your first target for when you hit some significant corruption. If the shadow player draws a hunt tile and it's a two or a three, you may want to go ahead and have Gandalf take that damage, particularly if you already have a Will the West die cast. Unlike all the other characters, when Gandalf dies, he can be brought back as Gandalf the White. And when he comes back as Gandalf the White, not only do you get an extra die, but he's a more powerful version, and he has some particularly strong abilities, like being able to summon the Ents. So, Try to have Gandalf take the the first damage 
that you can, but you know maybe not separate them out until they've already moved a little bit further, uh, unless he's gone ahead and, and died. In terms of Strider, you also want to turn him into Aragorn, and so that he could get that extra die, and he's particularly valuable as well. So what I would recommend is keeping him in the Fellowship a little bit longer and definitely not killing him off if you take damage. At this point, when Aragon is your leader, you may either want to take the damage in forms of corruption or kill one of the other random members, but definitely don't kill Aragon. At was kill Strider because you definitely want to turn him into Aragon. So keep him in for a few more turns, maybe when it gets a little bit lower, close to Lorien, and then maybe have him break out and try to make his way to Minas Tirith. Unless you draw the army of the undead, then you may want to move him into Rohan and then have him come in that way. That's actually what I did in the last game. I brought Aragorn Strider down to Rohan. I had that card. I waited for them to pair the attack doll Amroth, then I brought Strider in with the undead army, defeated that army, and then I had him, when they counterattacked, had him retreat into Dol Amroth, and then crown him as King Aragorn. So that, was, that worked out really well for me, and he was actually in that city for the rest of the game, defending it against large hordes of Easterlings and Orcs. So that's, that's a good strategy for get the most out of Aragorn and Gandalf, which are two characters that you definitely want to leave the Fellowship. The other members of the Fellowship, Bromir, Legolas, and, and Gimli are both useful and they both have some military advantages, but their buffer ability of being able to absorb two damage of corruption Unfortunately, that for, for them, that's actually a pretty good uh, use of them, particularly Legolas, that his ability to activate the elves is completely pointless because the elves start out as active. And Gondor is probably going to be active because they're going to be one of the first nations attacked. Gimli, however, if you want to do, if you do want to have a dwarven strategy, maybe you do want to have him. Um, for the most part, you may want to use or keep them in the Fellowship depending on what cards you draw. If you draw a card that it uses one of their particular abilities, maybe draw them away. Or if there's a, a card that has you separate the Fellowship in order to heal damage, then go ahead and do that. But you can't, in this game, you really can't have a set strategy because the cards actually make a huge difference of where you focus on and what kind of objectives you fulfill in order to use your cards. So don't plan on going in the exact way to Mount Doom or to use certain characters and not use certain characters. Try to be as flexible as possible. The two hobbits, Merry and Pippin, are actually also very useful to keep into the Fellowship because unlike all the other character all the other characters when they suffer the damage they actually get separated from the from this fellowship rather than truly dying but they get dropped off at wherever that spot is and they don't move all that fast on their own so definitely keep them around in order to get the two damage or the one damage that each of them can absorb but you still get to get the characters and Merry and Pippin are both pretty good. They both act as a leader, so will be able to give you a reroll. As well as a lot of cards have text that only work or reduce the shadow player's text if there's a companion in the battle. So having them around is very useful. So something that you need to keep in mind is this political trick. You can't muster until your nation is at war. The muster dice is what you use to move your track down the war. You may want, you definitely want to do a few of those on your own and not just count on the enemy attacking you in order to bring you into war. What could be a particularly dangerous strategy 
for the elves is they can't muster until they're at war and they're all the way up here so they can be attacked and brought into a siege in which they can't muster inside of a siege so if they move if the shadow player moves their armies around they could try to lock one area or even two areas into siege even before you can do a single muster so try to move the elves down on the war path if you see that they have a northern strategy and they think they may attack you same thing with rohan you may not want to be beat up on that many times before you can move into war yourself gondor is probably going to go the war as soon as as soon as a Skilliath is attacked as well as the city here down in the south these two areas are mostly sacrificial and you want to try to hold on to Minas Tirith and Dol Amroth as much as you can. So in terms of military advice, the Shadow has endless hordes that they're going to send against you. They're going to be aggressive and they're going to throw those armies into your well-defended strongholds. The free people do not have the luxury of being able to have constant reinforcements. Whenever a Gondor or a Rohan or an Elven unit, all the free people's units, when they die, they are de die and they're out of the game forever. While every orc and troll that you kill are just going to come back and be reformed yet again. For this reason, try to sell your lives as much as possible and take advantage of every military advantage you can think of. All you, just think of it this way, you're just buying time for the Fellowship. And every battle that they need to press, or every extra die they need to move their reinforcements around, is a victory for you. My advice for fortifications and cities is to always do the combat in the fortification first. Even if you're vastly outnumbered because you're going to be rolling at an advantage, but then withdraw as soon as you can. For a Skilliath and the Forge of Eisen, go ahead and move troops into it. So you roll at a 5 and a 6, and they only roll at a 6. But after the first round of combat, when you lose that ability, have everybody withdraw. A Skilliath withdraw into Minas Tirith. If Penagengar, or I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, gets attacked and this guy is lucky enough to survive, Go ahead and have him retreat this way or retreat up towards Minas Tirith, whatever needs the troops more. You have to sell your lives as much as, care, um, as much as possible. Try to have as few battles on even terrain where it's both of you having a five and a six as possible. This is your main advantage over the Shadow Player. You have to delay and you have to make their attacks very costly the most of which is is at strongholds where you have to force them to do two attacks to even truly uh, start to cause some casualties because even though you own a territory when they attack you can withdraw into a siege which is one of the places over here you can only put five army units, but those don't include leaders or companions of the fellowship. And then they have to attack an additional time. And when they attack in a stronghold, not only do you get the them only rolling at a six on the first wave of combat, but every wave of combat after that, they have to sacrifice an elite down to a regular in order to keep on pressing the attack. Now there's certain cards that allow them to bypass that and you should always be aware of that. But if the army is short on elites, you know you may be able to hold out or force them to keep on using multiple die and attacking you with just regulars and having them suffer the only rolling at a six penalty. So try to hold on to those strongholds as dearly as possible because this is where the shadow player is going to get the 10 victory points. 
They have five just in Gondor, and they have another three in Rohan. And then all they need to do is pick up another elven territory, and they have the ten points that they need. The war can't be fought on the backs of elves and Gondor alone. There are only so many troops that can be mustered, and the elves in particular, you'll be wishing for more pieces. Rohan must be utilized, and maybe even the men of the north or the dwarves. Minimize your risk of enemy cards. There are all sorts of really unpleasant cards that the shadow player can do to you, and it would be best for you to know them all, but Short of that, here are a few ways to avoid the the nastiest of them. If exposed and reveal and the fellowship is revealed, try to have them hidden again as soon as possible. Ideally move like when ideally try to move the fellowship early on in your round when you still have other character dice in which you could use to hide them if necessary because there are a lot of cards that are particularly nasty if the fellowship is exposed. Try your best not to be revealed in a shadow stronghold. Being caught passing through one is bearable but being landed right in the middle of Moria is really bad news. Not only do you get the normal hunt dial right away but you'll get another one when you try to leave Moria next turn as well. If you're in a shadow stronghold, try to get it out as soon as possible, even if you have to use the elven ring. Also, try to use your will the west die early on, because there's a shadow card that can neutralize them, so try to reduce that risk. Also, know your potential cards in the future, too. There are a few really great ones that can really set back the shadow player. There are three different end cards that, when used properly, can kill Saruman, taking a dice away and a powerful leader from the shadow player for the rest of the game. Another unexpected attack could be from the army of the undead that Aragorn or Strider can bring into one of three different coastal regions of Gondor. Try to use your cards to their max ability. Each card you draw, try to determine if you want to play, the, if you want to try to play the top text ability or if you want to save them for the combat. You can only hold six cards, so you don't ever want to have to discard any without getting any benefit at all. Saving cards and not using them during combat just to discard them um, when you're about to go over doesn't help you at all. In terms of strategy for the Fellowship, there is the cinematic approach of going d south from Rivendell through Moria to Lorien and then down through either R Rohan and Gondor into Minas Moria. Or in my last game, I actually did what Gandalf tried to do and I went through High Pass and I went along the northern route down into the Black Gate. And it actually worked out pretty well for me so um, th there's that path and I didn't have to go through Moria that way. There's also a southern route in which you can go along Isengard and then go along Rohan and through the Minas Moria. It's actually not as long as you would think because a lot of these areas are very large. It is a longer route, but it works pretty well. Just when you're moving through this area, this first initial ones, this is very important. And ideally what you want to do is if you are going to go through Moria, not do it until you want to go ahead and declare yourself outside of Moria. Or even say in the beginning of the turn, declare yourself out yourself as being in Lorien so you can heal a damage. But if you do do that, you will draw one hunt dial, but only one hunt dial. But try to get as far as you can without being revealed, and then you can see what your options were. This northern route was particularly well because if you need to be healed, you can drop by the woodland realm or dale in order to get healed. So I hope that's helpful 
for the Free People's Armies. It's tough. The Shadow Player is going to be hammering you. But retreat, hold into the strongholds, muster as much as possible. Only get five troops in there because that's all you can hold in a in a stronghold. Try to have five elites and plenty of leaders and maybe a companion here or there. Try to keep Aragon and and Gandalf the White as live as long as possible. Even though they're particularly useful in battle, you may want to go ahead and just keep Gandalf the White of Aragorn by himself. He's He's not being fully utilized, but he'll always be alive. And until you've used your third end card, it's going to keep Isengard wondering if you have that card in the back of your pocket. So keep that in mind, and my next video will be for the Shadow Player.